On behalf of the math and computer science department, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for this evening. Jordan Ellenberg is this year's fellow for the Charles Krauss Lecture Series. Dr. Ellenberg comes from, uh, to us from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where he is a professor of mathematics. He has a PhD from mathematics from Harvard. He also has a master's degree in fiction writing from Johns Hopkins and has written a novel. So for anyone in the audience who thinks that you have to make a philosophical choice in life between loving numbers and loving words, please reconsider. Dr. Ellenberg's work illustrates the contributions people can make when we seek clarity and elegance in observing the world around us. This evening is made possible because in 2001, Choate alumnus Charles A. Krauss, class of 1951, established a fund on the occasion of his 50th reunion. Quote, to encourage and train young people to speak in public with clarity and of thought, confidence, and enthusiasm, and to use this talent throughout their lives. Mr. Krauss was captain of the debate team during his student days at Choate. In addition to supporting the Pratt Declamation Contest and the Goodyear Presentations in World History, the Krauss Fund also provides a fellowship giving an academic department the opportunity to bring to campus an excellent public speaker who has made a distinguished contribution to his or her field and whose personal example may inspire others. Jordan Ellenberg's work is certainly inspiring. As a math teacher, his work inspires me to focus on the parts of math that are most relevant to my students. I hope that he inspires you tonight. I hope that he inspires in you tonight an appreciation of the power of math and a better understanding of the role it plays in all of our lives. I present to you Dr. Jordan Ellenberg. Well, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks. To, it's, to be in, uh, it's a great honor to be invited here. And um, I was not told that all you guys were going to be in your dresses and suits and ties. So <laughs> you have me as I am. <laughs> so let me start by telling you about the summer job that I had in college. So I was a math major, so I didn't have like a normal summer job. Um, this was my summer job. I got a job in a bio lab, um, and the guy who ran this lab, uh, whose name I'm not going to tell you for reasons that will be clear in a minute, uh, he wanted to know how many people were going to have tuberculosis in the year 2050, right? Major uh, health problem, major issue of public health interest. And so uh, what did I do? I approached this problem uh, the way a math major would. I made a model. So this guy gave me a big folder full of papers, and this was 1991, so when I say a folder, I mean an actual manila folder. Um, big folder, lots of papers, basically everything that was known at that time about the spread of tuberculosis. Um, the length of the maximally contagious period, the rate of transmission, uh, all of this stuff broken down by race, by age, by sex, by HIV status, every piece of information uh, you can imagine. And I took all this data and I put it together into a mathematical model. Um, modeling the spread of that disease. Um, and I ran the model year by year uh, from 1991 to 1992, 1993 to 1995, 2000, all the way out to 2050. And at the end of that process, uh, I had a number, and I gave the number to my boss, uh, and I got paid. And that was the end of my summer job. <laughs> That has never been an applause line in the history of telling this story. <laughs> but I'm glad you guys, I don't know if you guys like getting paid a lot or if it's that you like it. No, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll ask after. Um, it was the end of my summer job, but it wasn't the end of the story. Because like I said, I was a math major, I like to think things over. And when I went back and thought over the work that I had done, I started to get a little nervous. Because you know, you look at these papers, right? A paper says under these conditions, there's let's say a 13% rate of transmission. And what does that mean? Well, every number you see in a scientific paper has what's called an error bar around it, right? It has some degree of uncertainty. What does that 13% measure mean? It means they measured that in some study, and it means it's probably not 3%, and it's probably not 50%, but you know, it might be 10%, might be 17%. Um, there's a range. And when you go back and figure that into your model, you plug in that uncertainty. You say, well, what would happen if instead of 13, I put 10? 
or I put 17. Um, and I do that with every number that's in my model. And then I start to iterate that year after year, right? 91 to 92, 92 to 95, 95 to 3,000, et cetera, et cetera. Those uncertainties, those error bars, they start to feed back into each other, right? They start to multiply together, and those errors get bigger and bigger. And what happens is that eventually, the signal is totally overwhelmed by the noise. In other words, what I learned, when I really went back and thought about it a little bit more, is that by making different choices, all of which were well within reasonable bounds for what those parameters actually were, what was going on with tuberculosis, I could make it come out that tuberculosis was extinct in the year 2050, and I could make it so that tuberculosis was endemic throughout the entire world population in the year 2050. So my actual level of knowledge about this question looks something like this. Um, <coughs> And I went back to my boss. I was, a, I was a conscientious guy when I was in college. I, I went back to my boss and I was like, look, I, I know I told you this number, but the truth is I thought about it some more. And actually, uh, I have no idea <laughs> how many people are going to have tuberculosis in the year 2050. And, and also, neither do you. Um, and here's the, here's the tragic ending of this story, which is that um, my boss did not care. I, I, he did not care about that. I mean, he said, look, like you made your, I asked you to make your best guess. You made it. I'm using it. That's fine. That's, that's what I asked you for. Um, and what I find particularly painful about this story is that I know that the guy went around like giving lots of talks like about this work and about the uh, prognosis of tuberculosis in the future. And if somebody asked him, uh, where does this number come from? He would have said, well, I hired a guy and he did the math. So what I want to do today, I guess now tonight, is kind of complicate maybe what you guys think math is and what it means to do the math about a problem. Um, and in order to do that, let me quickly tell you another story. Basically, I'm just going to tell you a lot of math stories tonight. Um, this is a mathematician, uh, a guy called Abraham Wall. Um, he grows up in Hungary and Austria, uh, gets thrown out. Uh, when the Nazis came out, take over, he manages to make it to the United States. Um, and eventually, uh, when the war starts, he's a professor at Columbia. Um, and he starts working for the SRG, the Statistical Research Group. So what, what is this? Um, it was a top secret group of mathematicians and statisticians, some of the best in the country, um, who were working uh, in a lab in Morningside Heights, right near Columbia, um, working on all mathematical problems related to the conduct of the war throughout World War II. So it was, it was kind of like the Manhattan Project, except it was actually in Manhattan. <laughs> and one day, a group of generals uh, came to the SRG, and they came to Abraham Wald with a problem. This was the problem. They had noticed that but when a plane comes back from flying a mission over Germany, it looks kind of like this, covered in bullet holes, right? But what they noticed is that the bullet holes were not evenly distributed across the entire plane. Some parts of the plane were going to hit more than others. There were more bullet holes in the fuselage, less bullet holes in the engine. And what they wanted to know from the SRG um, it was a question about armoring the plane. This is a serious issue, right? Because uh, you don't want to armor the plane too little, you, don't, you want to be protected, but you don't want to armor the plane too much because armor is heavy and then the plane can't really fly. Um, so they wanted to do this very carefully. They wanted to do it optimally. And they said, look, we need to know how much more armor should we be putting on the parts of the plane that are getting hit more? Like, is there some kind of a formula or an equation or a graph that you math guys can give us for this? Um, and here's what happened. They came with this question, and Wall told them, no, you guys have it completely wrong. What you have to do is put the armor where the bullet holes are not. Well, this was not the answer that the generals expected. Let's take a moment to sort of let it sink in, what a strange answer it is. Um, and Wall went on to explain, you see, it's not that the Germans can't hit your planes on the engine. Is it the planes that got hit on the engine were the ones that are not coming back from Germany? <laughs> now let that sink in. <laughs> 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 
Once you see it, it's kind of obvious, right? But, oh, I saw somebody high-fiving. Did somebody get it? <laughs> You're high. Um, so here's the thing, I, here's the point I want to make. I mean, Wall did not give them a formula. He did not give them an equation or a chart or a graph. But he did do the math. What he was doing was mathematical. Mathematics is not just a matter of carrying out a calculation, right? A computer can do that. Your phone can do that. Um, mathematics is not just about getting the right answer to a question. It's about asking the right question. And even about rejecting the question that's being asked to you if it's the wrong question, as it was in this case. So what this makes me think of, and stay with me here. Um, Oh, I, I have another slide, sorry. I didn't show you the numbers. Fewer on the engine, more on the few slides. OK. Um, so, what this, so what this always makes me think of is, um, do we know who this is? American history buffs? Teddy Roosevelt, did he go here? Um, <laughs> I mean, it could be. I don't know. Okay, um, um, So this is Theodore Roosevelt, um, and I want to read you a little bit of a very famous speech he gave. He gave it at the Sorbonne in Paris in, uh, in 1910. Um, anybody know this speech? Is it a famous line? I'm going to read just a paragraph. Um, he says, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause, who at his best knows in the end the triumphs of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. I mean, we're here to honor Charles Krauss and the art of rhetoric. And, well, this is a hell of a piece of rhetoric, right? <laughs> this is a speech that's commonly quoted and uttered when you want to rev people up. It was uh, Teddy's cousin, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, sort of uses this in his last a uh, campaign speech in 1936. Uh, Richard Nixon uses this when he's resigning in uh, 1974. Um, a speech I like to watch every year on August 9th. I highly recommend it. Um, uh, Brene Brown quoted in a TED Talk that's been watched more than 4 million times. I know that's like the modern standard of great rhetoric, how many times your TED Talk has been seen. Um, so it's a great speech, but what I want to do tonight is kind of push back on it a little bit and tell you what I think Roosevelt missed. Because here's the thing, when Roosevelt sneers at the cold and timid souls who kind of sit on the sidelines and don't get in the fight, I, I think about Abraham Wall. I mean, this is a guy who, as far as I know, never lifted a weapon in anger. But he made a serious contribution to the American war effort in World War II, right? Without firing a shot. Exactly, and how did he do it? Exactly by counseling the doers of deeds how to do them better. He was unbloody undusty and unsweaty, but he was right. He was, in both senses of the word, a critic who counted. So, bringing us up to the modern moment. Yeah, I got it, okay. <laughs> okay, one of my favorite critics who counts. Who knows who this guy is? He's very topical. No. <laughs> okay. Maybe I'll give another talk on all Jews look alike. No. It's not. Okay. Um, this is this is Nate Silver. Yes, I love it. Whoever does that, this is Nate Silver. 
Nate the Great, as we call him in the math biz. No, I mean, this is a guy, look, I'm very proud of my profession as a math teacher, but this guy in the year 2012, the election year of 2012, probably taught more math to more American people than every math professor in the country put together. I gotta admit. Um, and what makes him so good? What makes him so educational? What makes him so able to do what he does? I mean, what's great is that he's really able to talk about uncertainty. That's our theme, right? The ability to talk about uncertainty and push back on numerical answers to questions. So, I mean, what does political discourse usually look like in this country? Um, wait, somebody shows you a picture like this. And they're like, okay, election coming up. Who's gonna win? Is it Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton? And like one person will say, oh, it's Hillary Clinton. Here's three reasons why. The other person will say, no, it's Donald Trump. Here are three, re three reasons why. Um, you can watch it every night. It's the same thing every night. Very little information is actually transmitted. Um, if you ask Nate Silver what's going on in the election, um, the answer is gonna look a little more like this which I find much more satisfying, and I'll try to convince you that you should too. Um, this is, um, I, I would love to have a more up-to-date slide, but it's a bit too early, it's a bit too soon before the 2016 election to have this. Um, this is a picture of what we would call a probability distribution, and this is, I think, from October 2012, if I remember correctly, about a month before that presidential election. Um, and what Nate Silver will say is, he will not tell you Obama's gonna win, and he will not tell you Romney's going to win, he will give instead the correct answer, which is that either of those guys can win. We do not actually know because it's in the future, and that's what the future means. What we can do is talk about probabilities, and what we can do is talk openly about our uncertainty and say, um, I think, and he thought in October 2012, there was about a 20% chance that Obama was going to get, um, I think that's 332 electoral votes, and those other spikes correspond to other reasonably likely outcomes uh, that Silver thought at that time were relatively probable. Um, I have a slightly more up-to-date slide. This is just something I, um, I grabbed yesterday. Um, this is about uh, Democratic Senate pickups. So this, this, kind of, this is not from Nate Silver. As you can tell, it's not as pretty of a diagram. Um, but this kind of discourse has actually become, like, to the great surprise of every math teacher, rather popular in the press. So this is now sort of how we talk about how many Senate seats are the Democrats likely to pick up uh, in, the upcoming, uh, in the upcoming election. Maybe, um, maybe three is most likely, two and four are like reasonably likely, and then with sort of much smaller probabilities of a much uh, bigger gain for the Democrats or even a gain by the Republicans. This gives us massively more information than just somebody saying, this is what's going to happen. So this is sort of what Nate Silver brought the presidential politics, the ability to talk openly about uncertainty, to say, I'm not sure who's going to win. And let me tell you something, people hated it. Not everybody, I mean, lots of readers read it, but the traditional political reporters hated this. I'll read you a quote I like. This is Dylan Byers writing in Politico. Um, he wrote, this may shock the coffee-drinking NPR types of Seattle, San Francisco, and Madison. So, I live in Madison and I drink a lot of coffee and listen to NPR, so I was very interested <laughs> uh, to be shocked by this. He said, um, but more than a few pundits and reporters, including some of his colleagues, believe Silver is highly overrated. He wrote, should Mitt Romney win on November 6th, it's difficult to see how people can continue to put faith in the predictions of someone who has never given that candidate anything higher than a 41% chance of winning. And one week from the election gives him a one in four chance. For all the confidence Silver puts in his predictions, he often gives the impression of hedging. Okay, this kind of talk was very common in the runs of the election, and it is the kind of thing that I gotta tell you, if you were a mathematician, really makes you wanna like stab yourself in the hand with the fork. <laughs> it's very upsetting, because we don't talk about other domains of uncertainty this way, right? Let me give you an example. If you turn on the weather, and the meteorologist says there's a 25% chance of rain, do you say, why won't that guy commit? <laughs> What's wrong with him? Why won't he tell me whether it's going to rain or not? Why is he hedging? No, that's not hedging. And you know what? If he says there's a 25% chance of rain and it does rain, you don't think the guy should be fired, right? You're like, I've lost all confidence in that guy. He said it probably wasn't going to rain, and it did. No, that's ridiculous. And the reason that's ridiculous is because we understand 
that the weather is in some fundamental way uncertain, and that we have to talk about it in that language. If the weather is fundamentally uncertain, how much more so something that has to do with large-scale human behavior? <laughs> right? I mean, like the weather, at least there's like some differential equation that you can like sort of do and do a pretty good job. Uh, for an election, no. So, um, so what actually happened um, in 2012, um, in fact, <laughs> As you may have heard, like uh, Mitt Romney is not president. Um, Obama did win, and, and more than and more so than that, actually, uh, Silver's predictions were correct in every state. So then you may say, oh, so then like everybody was like, wow, I was wrong. Like that guy's great. No, of course not. Then they hated him even more. Okay. <laughs> so let me read. This is one of my favorite quotes about this stuff by a, a writer named Leon Wieseltier. I don't know if you guys know him. He's a writer for the New Republic. He has been for about. 80 years or something like this. Um, here's what he says. He's very angry about Nate Silver. He says, there is no numerical answer to the question of whether men should be allowed to marry men, and the question of whether the government should help the weak, and the question of whether we should intervene against genocide. And so the intimidation by quantification practiced by Silver and the other data mullahs must be resisted. Nate Silver has made a success out of an escape into diffidence. What is it about conviction that frightens these people? Let me show you, I mean, I just want to show you his face again. He's really not a mullah. Um, so where does this come from? I mean, to me, I hear in Leon Wiesel here, I hear the echoes of Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, I feel like... It harkens back to this way of thinking that says, what's important is to go all in. What's important is to commit. Not to hand back and say, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. I want to kind of stick up for the people who say, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Because that is often the correct answer. And to not say that is to give the wrong answer, just like I gave the wrong answer inadvertently to my summer job boss. And as mathematicians, I want us not to do that. I want us to be at ease, or if not at ease, at least open about our uncertainty and try to speak about it using the language of mathematics, which is the only language we have in which to talk about uncertainty effectively. I mean, I almost think that Wieseltier's view is, reflects a belief among many people uh, who are not spending all day thinking about math in a kind of one-drop rule that somehow if you do just a little bit of quantitation in your thinking, then you're basically like outsourcing your entire intuition to mathematics. You're just turning yourself into a spreadsheet or a robot. Okay, anyone who actually does math knows that this is not what the experience of doing math is like. It's a marriage between mathematical tools and intuitive tools. Um, I wish that always came through in our math courses. It doesn't. Maybe some of you noticed. Um, but it is the way it really is. And some of the ideas, I mean, I guess my ideas about this, they were really crystallized Actually, not by Nate Silver, not by Abraham Wall, uh, not by my summer job, but by this guy. This is a hard one. Anybody know who this is? <laughs> <laughs> not a Jew. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is John Ashbery, uh, one of the great American poets of our time. Um, I just want to read you a little bit of like one of his poems, probably his most famous poem called Soonest Mended, which he wrote in 1964. Um, he says it better than I can say it myself. So I know you guys weren't brief. There was going to be poetry tonight, but a little bit. This is, so this is the end of Soonest Mended. I highly recommend reading the whole thing. He says, and you see, both of us were right though nothing has somehow come to nothing. The avatars of our conforming to the rules and living around the home have made, well, in a sense, good citizens of us. Brushing the teeth and all that, and learning to accept the charity of the hard moments as they are doled out. For this is action, this not being sure, this careless preparing, sowing the seeds crooked in the furrow, making ready to forget and always coming back to the mooring of starting out that day so long ago. 
For this is action. This not being sure. This is something I say to myself like a mantra. And it is not, by the way, what Theodore Roosevelt thought was action. Right? Theodore Roosevelt would have puked if you read this poem. But I think it is the kind of action that Nate Silver undertakes, and it's the kind of action that Abraham Wald undertakes, um, and it's the kind of action that I think we, as mathematically minded modern people, should be willing to undertake when necessary. We need doers of deeds, but we also need critics, doubters, hesitators, questioners. And as much as we should, I think we should strive to be both of these, both of these at once. Let me, come, let me come back to Nate a little bit. I want to sort of make one more interesting point about uh, what he does. Here's a more complicated chart, also drawn from around the same time, around October uh, 2012. Um, again, we'll be seeing charts much like this in just a few months, but still too early. So what this represents is Nate Silver's own estimation of how likely he thought he was to get each state right. In other words, if you look at this, he's saying, OK, I think Oregon is 98% likely to go Obama. So he's going to call that state for Obama. Another way to say that is he thinks there's a 2% chance he's going to get Oregon wrong. Right? A 2% chance that Romney will actually win despite his prediction. OK, that's not very much of a chance. He's pretty confident in that prediction. On the other hand, if you take a closer state, like say uh, um, New Hampshire, he gives Obama a 75% chance of winning that state, which means he actually thinks there's a fairly substantial, a 1 in 4 chance that Romney will actually win that state, and he'll get it wrong. So you can sort of do a fun exercise. Um, you can ask, OK, what if you asked Nate Silver to predict how many states he was going to get wrong? It's a little meta, I know. <laughs> but let's do it. This is math we can do. Um, you can say, for instance, that he predicts his chance of getting New Hampshire wrong is 25%. A, a, a way to think of this is that maybe if you imagine you know, 10,000 possible worlds and 2,500 of them, he would get New Hampshire wrong. And you can do this for each state and just add them up. Um, so on average, he's going to get about a quarter of a wrong answer for New Hampshire, 0.37 of a wrong answer for Colorado, someplace like New North Carolina where he's pretty sure, not contributing too much of a chance of a wrong answer. And if you add it all up, I think he would have predicted that he would get about three states wrong. Um, I sort of wish somebody had asked him this because I think it would be incredibly funny if he had been criticized for getting more states right than he said he was going to get. <laughs> but it didn't happen. Um, what principle is reflected here? It was, I think, best summed up by the philosopher of Willard Van Orman Quine, who said, I always think I'm right, but I don't think I'm always right. Now let this sink in, OK? It does actually make sense. I mean, after all, we have the beliefs we have, right? But if we are reflective thinking individuals, we know that we are not perfect thinkers. We're not right about everything. We don't know which things we're wrong about. If we did, we would just change our opinions about those things, of course. But with near certainty, we can say we're wrong about some things. And again, it's the language of probability that allows Silver to sort of say this not just in this sloganistic kind of way, <coughs> but in a quantitative way. But it seems a little bit like a contradiction, right? It seems like a funny thing to say. <coughs> I've talked a lot about uncertainty. Now I want to pivot and talk about contradiction a little bit. I think the, 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 the folk view of how contradiction looks to a mathematician um, maybe looks something like this. Um, so this guy is like is Captain James T. Kirk um, of the Starship Enterprise. Who's with me? Anyone? Okay. Um, so what James T. Kirk used to do a lot in kind of old school original series Star Trek is there would be like some evil robot or something, and he would always defeat the robot like in the same in the same way, well, which was to sort of tell it a contradiction, and then the robot would kind of like make a face like this because its robot mind was like, unable to handle a contradiction, and then it would like catch on fire, and then that would be the end of the episode. Um, so I think there is a kind of a stereotype that to think mathematically, as I said, is to think like a robot, to be unable to handle a contradiction. And we don't want to be able to unable to handle a contradiction. In fact, um, 
I think a more positive model is given to us uh, by S. Scott Fitzgerald, who in his famous essay, in, in his essay, The Crack Up, um, he writes this very famous remark. He says, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. Do you guys know this? OK, it's great. And the essay, I mean, it's incredibly depressing. I feel like I've given you the one inspirational quote. And then, um, but still, read it if you like reading about like why not to become like an alcoholic and ruin your life, definitely. <laughs> uh, that's like my one most useful piece of advice <laughs> in this talk. Um, so again, it might seem that in mathematics we are supposed to be intolerant of contradiction. We're supposed to think about which things are true and which things are false, and a thing cannot be true, both true and false. And that's true so far as it goes. Things cannot be both true or false at the same time. But that's not what Fitzgerald said, right? He didn't say you should believe contradictory things. He said you should be able to hold the opposing ideas in your mind and once and still function. And that is exactly what mathematicians do. Just like Nate Silver holds the idea in his mind that he thinks he's right, but he knows that he's wrong. He doesn't know about what, but he knows there's something. He knows that there's something that he thinks he's right about that he's actually wrong about. Um, as mathematicians, we do the same. So I gotta say, you know, there's a saying in math that in every math talk, there should be a proof. <laughs> That's also not usually an applause line. In this case, it also was not, as usual. <laughs> Here's the thing. I actually have this proof on a slide, but I took it off, but I'm a little ahead of schedule. How do I, if I have the slide, we talk about it. But guess what? I'm not gonna talk about it because I don't have the slide. Um, but what is this dude right here? It is an isosceles right triangle. The king of right triangles. Um, its sides are, are, its two legs have length one and one and its hypotenuse by the Pythagorean theorem, really in some sense the first mathematical theorem ever proved, uh, is the square root of two. Um, but the good news is that I can just sort of stand here and talk about it a little bit without giving the proof. Um, maybe I can tell you about how, like, how weird the Pythagoreans were in the time I would have used to present this proof. Um, they were really weird. Um, I mean, they weren't mathematicians like the ones we have today. What they, their philosophy was kind of, it was sort of a mix of like what we would now call kind of a cultural religion and what we would now call mathematics. Um, Pythagoras, um, he believed that you shouldn't eat beans because they had souls. Um, he was said to be able to talk to animals, um, and he told them not to eat beans. Um, but he also sort of, in some sense, was the first mathematician in the sense that we now know. Uh, they were very interested in, in numbers and harmony. Um, his school developed the theorem we now know as the Pythagorean theorem, which tells us that the square of the hypotenuse of the right triangle is equal to the sums of the squares of the other two sides. Uh, and in particular, it tells us that the, the hypotenuse of this triangle uh, is a number whose square is two. So for the Pythagoreans, what did a number mean? A number meant a ratio. One integer divided by another. So they were very interested in figuring out which ratio it was that when you squared it, you got two. And then came some bad news. The square root of two, it turns out, is what we call, in mathematics, an irrational number. That is, there is no ratio of whole numbers between you square it, you get two. That's what I'm not going to prove on my slide, but trust me. Um, but what I want to do is tell you a little something about how this is proved. By the way, it's, it's, we don't really know the story. This was a long, long time ago. But the story was that it was a guy called Hippasus who proved this, and the Pythagoreans were extremely PO'd by this. Uh, and they threw him into the ocean and drowned him for <laughs> proving such a disgusting theorem. Um, probably not true. Um, so the way you prove this theorem is it's, it's, it's really the first example in math history of what is called a proof by contradiction. What you do is you suppose that there is a ratio whose square is equal to two. 
And from that, you derive a contradiction. You derive that you know must be false. And from this, you conclude that the only way out of this disgusting logical perplexity is that your initial hypothesis, that there was a ratio equal to the length of this hypotenuse, that just must have been wrong. I mean, if we're not going to accept a contradiction, we can't accept anything that leads to a contradiction. Um, and that means that there simply must not be, square root of 2 must not be a ratio, which the Pythagoreans meant it was not a number at all. This is why they were so confused. They had no notion of a rational number. They felt they were being told that the length of this side of the triangle just isn't a number at all. That's why they were mad. It's a funny thing, the proof by contradiction. Sometimes called the reductio ad absurdum. I mean, it requires you to sort of hold in your mind something that you believe is true, what you're trying to, what you're trying to prove, but reason as if you believed it was false. That's an extremely strange thing to do. It gives you a strange feeling when you first start doing it. I don't know if any of you guys have done it in your courses. Um, but it really is exactly what Fitzgerald was asking us to do. Um, it's sort of, it's like lucid dreaming of a very systematic kind, or maybe I'll quote Ashbury one more time. He, elsewhere in the poem, he, he says, a kind of fence sitting raised to the level of an aesthetic ideal. That to me is a great description of proof by contradiction. And we can do it because we are not robots. We can do it without short circuiting ourselves. In fact, it's kind of a common piece of advice. I got it from my PhD advisor. He probably got it from his PhD advisor. That if you're trying to prove something, you should try to prove it during the day and try to disprove it by night. It's sort of weird advice, right? Like, why work against yourself? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is it's kind of a hedge. Because after all, you might be wrong. Right? You might just be wrong about what's the case. And then if you spend all day every day trying to prove this thing is true, and it's actually false, you're wasting your time. But there's sort of a deeper reason. If something is true, and you try to disprove it, you're going to fail, right? Because the thing's true, you can't disprove it. And I think we're all trained to think of failure as bad. Do they train you that here? OK. That's a problem. Look, I mean, failure is not all bad. Here's what, because you can learn from failure. I mean, here's what happens when you try to disprove something that's true. You try to disprove it one way, and you hit a wall. And you try to disprove it another way, and you hit another wall. And every night you try to disprove it, and every night you, you fail, and every night you build a new wall. And eventually, if you are lucky, those walls come together into a structure. And that structure is the structure of the proof that the thing is true. In other words, if you understand why you have failed again and again, to do the opposite of what you want to do, you will understand how to do what you want to do. And I really believe, I want to tell you guys, that proving by day and disproving by night, I do not think this is just for mathematics. Neither did Fitzgerald, right? I really think it's a good habit, one of the best ones that I've learned from math, to put pressure on all your beliefs, not just your mathematical beliefs, your social beliefs, your political beliefs, your scientific beliefs. Believe whatever you believe all day long, that's cool. But at night, argue against the things that you believe most dearly. And don't cheat. I mean, you really got to reason as if you believe the opposite of what you believe by day. Um, you might change your beliefs. That might happen. But if you don't, if you can't talk yourself out of the things that you believe, I think, and this is definitely how it is in math, you will come to understand much more why you believe what you do. In what is it grounded? This is action. This not being sure. In math, we use uncertainty and contradiction as essential tools. We're not afraid of them. We don't shy away from them. It's sort of, I mean, I guess I would say it's a fundamental part of being human is not just to be uncertain, but to be uncertain with a purpose, right? Like Nate Silver, to give the right answer instead of the wrong one. Um, to tolerate contradiction, and even to use it the way Hippasus did, or was said to have done, in order to bring mathematics into this irrational post-Pythagorean age. So of course, I'm thinking about F. Scott Fitzgerald here. Um, but I'm also thinking about Samuel Beckett. Um, 
He actually writes about Capasus' proof in, in one of his books, and he also has the very, very famous slogan, I can't go on, I'll go on, which you may know. It sort of it somehow expresses the same feeling. But, you know, maybe I'm going to close um, with one of the writers who's closest to my heart. Um, who knows who this is? This is the last slide, so there will be no more questions on this quiz. This is David Foster Wallace. Yes. It's David Foster Wallace, really the most mathematical of our novelists, and the novelists of our time, that I had discovered more or less on my own while taking a mathematical logic course in school. The fraudulence paradox was that the more time and effort you put into trying to appear impressive or attractive to other people, the less impressive or attractive you felt inside. You were a fraud, and the more of a fraud you felt like, the harder you tried to convey an impressive or likable image of yourself so that other people wouldn't find out what a hollow, fraudulent person you really were. I don't think it's too much to say that David Foster Wallace's writing was driven by his struggle with contradictions. He was trained mathematically, but also trained as a writer, and I think he saw both sides of the idea of the contradiction. He was in love with the technical and analytic, but he also saw that sort of the lessons, the sort of pre-technical lessons of religion and of self-help offered better weapons against drug addiction, despair, and solipsism. You know, he knew it was supposed to be a writer's job to get inside other people's heads, um, but his chief subject was the predicament of being stuck inside his own head. He was determined to record and neutralize the influence of his own preoccupations and prejudices, kind of like the, we were talking about Bayesianism and the battle with bias in, a, in, a, in, in, in the AP SAS today. Um, that's there in his writing. Um, <coughs> But he knew that that determination that he had was itself among those preoccupations and subject to those prejudices. I mean, in some sense, this is basic philosophy, right? Philosophy 101. But I think what he understood is that sometimes the old problems you meet in high school, in philosophy 101, or even in trigonometry, are some of the deepest you'll ever see, and you can wrestle with them your whole life. And Wallace is a writer he seems to me that he wrestled with those paradoxes very much the same way mathematicians do. I mean, what happens? You believe two things that seem to be in opposition. So you go to work, step by step, clearing the brush, separating what you know from what you believe, holding those hypo opposing hypotheses side by side in your mind, and viewing each in the adversarial light of the other, until the truth, or the nearest you can get to it, comes clear. So I'll stop there. Thank you guys so much.
that it's a human created system. I mean, I think that's where it lives. It lives in our minds. And yet, and yet, we treat it as if it's not. We, that's the world that we live in, and we feel it's just as real as the world of people and chairs and rocks and stones. And I guess I would say, I can't really make a good claim that mathematical objects like the number seven like have a reality outside the human mind and are not just constructions. But, so are those things real? I can't really convince you that they are, but I think they're at least as real as like rocks and animals and high schools and things like that, which are also human constructions. Thank you. to what's typically seen as like a really boring rational subject with like thoughtless brains that just kind of put punch in numbers. And how do you think that our school as an academic system and as a community can seek to change that? So, so first I gotta know when the, when your friend said this is gonna be like incredibly boring, what what did you say? I said no way, it's no math. Okay. <laughs> Good, I've got my people in the audience. So, obviously a lot of mathematicians, and especially people like me who are math educators, uh, lose a lot of sleep over this exact question of like, why do people, in general, not of their own free will, flock to us to learn from us? <laughs> We notice. <laughs> um, it, it's funny. I mean, it's a multi. It's, it's a multifarious thing. I mean, maybe I'll sort of concentrate on one aspect of it. You know, I, I mean, I wrote a book with a kind of provocative title, "How Not to Be Wrong." It's a bit of an oversell. I got to be honest with you guys. I mean, I'm wrong a lot, and so are many mathematicians. Um, but I do think this idea of being wrong is something that people find very painful. Nobody likes to be wrong, and in math, sometimes you are wrong, in a way that I think is less true in the in a high school context and your other courses. I mean, of course, you could be wrong about a historical fact or about something that becomes of a character in a novel, but in, in general, most of what is going to happen in those classes is not you saying something and being met with, that's just simply wrong, what you said. Um, I don't think we can change that feature of mathematics, nor do I think we should. Um, but what I hope, I mean, in some sense, this is part of what I wanted to talk about tonight, is that I want us to try to find being wrong less fearful. And sort of, I mean, every time we're wrong is an opportunity to learn. And I sort of, I mean, as a working mathematician, you are wrong all the time. Like, if you look at my notebook, like my research notebook, what you will see is like, Lots and lots of pages, and then like constantly in the margins, sort of something crossed out, and then like, you know, no exclamation point, or wrong, or like worse words that I can't say in this talk. But I mean, like, this is, this is actually, I mean, actually working, actually doing something. If something's going to actually happen, it has to involve screwing up a lot, and just being dead wrong a lot. And as I think part of our education is like learning to tolerate that. And maybe, maybe math, maybe we can be affected as a laboratory for becoming psychologically comfortable. Thank you. Sam? Um, hello. I, again, just like everyone else, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you so much for coming. So I guess my question is, you talked a lot about how we want to break this idea that mathematicians are these, like, that they're just using the mind, that these souls feel they're just plugging in numbers and finding out what's statistically best. But I haven't really gotten quite as much of a sense for how do we balance these numbers that we get and these thoughts and reasons that we come up with, and how we balance that, balance that with morality, especially when the two contradict one another, when what's most efficient might not necessarily be what's morally right. So, it's a really interesting question, and again, one with like a 
very long tradition of, of argument historically. Um, it's funny, at dinner, I was talking about my admiration for when you go back and read things from like a few hundred years ago, um, people didn't really draw the distinction that they do now between mathematics and science and philosophy, including moral philosophy. Um, and in general, I'm like, oh, it's kind of nice when all those things were intermingled. On the, other, on the other hand, I must admit, I mean, I am a modern person who lives in the year 2016, and I am pretty sympathetic to the idea that math's job, in the end, is to address questions which are in some way quantitative, like which are, and so you say like, well, what if the most efficient thing is not morally right? I guess I would say I actually don't see it as, I see it as math's job to figure out what's most efficient, but it's not math's job to figure out what's morally right. I actually think math is silent on that point. Not everyone agrees, but that's how I see it. Thank you. This will, this will be our last question. Our speaker will be in the lobby if you have more questions afterwards, but Andy? So you should observe that in school and not a lot of people like math. Like, I think choice is a school where people appreciate math more than usual, but even though math's not a popular subject. Do you think like it is useful of our resources to spend teaching math in a sense that it's very like solid and academical? Because you can see like not a lot of people like math, if you invest those resources on say, teach logic or creative thinking, considering that a lot of those students move on to do something that's slightly less math-based than what we teach in school would be more effective. I, I mean, let me put it this way. If I thought we should only spend our time on things that people like, on things that are the most popular, I would never have tried to like write literary fiction. <laughs> I don't think we should value only the popular. Um, so I, you know, it's funny. Math is a special place in school, right? And I mean, I think uh, in some sense, math and English in an American school are the two subjects that somehow there's no compromise on, right? We ask every student to learn quite a lot of it. Um, unsurprisingly, I have no problem with that. Um, maybe you should ask someone less unbiased, but um, well, why do I think that's okay? Um, because I do think it's sort of a cliche thing to say, but I think that it's correct that math is in some ways foundational to many other things. It's foundational, of course, to, to the sciences, um, but even more so, at least in my mind, and I hope I, I kind of tried to like portray or this plays out in my own mind in this talk, um, I think mathematical thinking, I mean, how to put it? I say in the subtitle of my book, I call it The Power of Mathematical Thinking. The one problem with that is it makes it sound like it's some specialized kind of thinking that you might do or not do. No, I don't think that. I think that mathematical thinking is one of the fiber, basic fibers of our cognition. It's wrapped up with everything else. It can't be separated. And so I think, I mean, maybe this will be provocative, but I think if we are not mathematical thinkers, we are not fully thinking. I do believe that. Let's thank our 